Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 18th to the 24th of November. I'm Ezzy Pearson, the magazine's features editor, and I'm joined on the podcast today by Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzy. It's good to be back. How are you? I'm doing well. So what do we have coming up in the night sky this week in November? Okay, well, after last week's supermoon, of course, the moon is now waning and it's going to pass Mars in the middle of the week. So keep an eye out for that. Mm. And we have another shadow transit on Saturn as it ever nears its ring plane crossing in March next year. So moonrise, yeah, it's waning. We're starting the week off with a 94% illuminated moon on the 18th and ending the week on the 24th at just 40% illumination. So this is welcome news for fans who like to observe the deep sky. And yeah, as it's waning and moving in its orbit, there are some lovely lunar sights to enjoy as it glides down through Taurus into Gemini. Solar system-wise, on the 18th, cast your eyes above from the east towards the south around midnight on the 18th, and you will catch Mars, the Moon, Jupiter, and Uranus in this fabulous area of the sky. We have the brilliant Orion. It's now risen in the Northern Hemisphere, and you will see the hunter below Jupiter at this time too. So, yeah, you know, from east to south on the 18th, well, all week, in fact, it's going to be just a really nice kind of horizon to keep your eyes on so yeah and we also have Saturn setting low in the west so lots to look out for well like I said all week really Mm -hmm. for planet wise and and Orion it's so good to have Orion back I think Mm, I know it's a classic one but Orion's always my favorite constellation it's a classic I know (laughs) (laughs) there's so much fun stuff to see in it and it's just it's one that everybody knows well, that's it. You can point it out and people learn it very quickly. Yeah, and it's a bit like an old friend, isn't it? You just see the Ryan's belt and you're like, oh, Ryan, he's mm-hmm. back. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like you said, there's just so much to see in Orion. So, you know, even like from people who are just starting out in astronomy to the real professionals with the cameras and telescopes. So yes, this is a fantastic constellation to look at. Fair enough about Orion. We'll go back to Saturn. <laughs> On the 20th, we have Titan Shadow crossing Saturn at 7.44pm until 10.54pm. So this is, well, hopefully good viewing from the UK, providing it's not cloudy. So the shadow transit on the 4th of November just grazed the planet, but tonight we will see a better transit of Titan Shadow. So just to recap, you know, we have been discussing over the past couple of weeks, Saturn is currently moving towards a ring plane crossing in March 2025 when we'll see its rings edge on so this is providing us some really good opportunities to view the planets moons and shadow transits. So also on the 20th the moon will start to pass to the left of Mars at around 9 p.m and as the night progresses keep an eye on this charming pairing to see the moon and Mars in a near straight line at 11 p.m. You'll also be able to see Castor and Pollux, the heads of Gemini, the twins located to the upper right. I do also love seeing Gemini in the night sky now as well. It's one of those constellations that look like their name. Yeah. Don't they? <laughs> so. I can see two stick figures there. Yeah, like, you can very Two stick easily. figures holding hands. That's definitely what that is. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely one. Yeah, it's great to have them back. And... Venus can be spotted low in the southwest all week. It's visible in the evening twilight, setting around 6.45 p.m. by the week's end. So comet-wise, we can't stop talking about the comets. (laughs) It should still be visible through binoculars, starting the week at around magnitude 8.2 and ending the week at around magnitude 8.8. As usual, you want to be looking for the comet in the southwest after the sun has set and tracking it down towards the west as it sets, which by the end of the week is around 9.20 p.m. Do you think you're going to try and get out and, and view the comet at all, Lizzie? I will try and get out and see it. 
It's not the easiest for me because I have to properly get in a car and do some traveling. Okay, yes. In order to get to somewhere that's going to be dark enough to see that. But I've definitely, I've tried to see it a couple of times before now. Oh, yeah, Um, (laughs) not happening. No. You need to get that photograph. I do. (laughs) We'll try. We'll try and get there. And we can shout about it when we speak next. So deep sky wise on the 21st in the very early hours of the morning, there was a lovely trio to enjoy. If you look to the east after midnight, you will see Mars, a 70% lit waning moon, and M44, the beehive cluster, which is within the constellation of Cancer. They're going to be grouped together. Good old beehive cluster. (laughs) Yeah. So it's, again, another object that seems really popular Mm. for astronomers. I mean, it's an open cluster of around a thousand stars. So yeah, it's going to be lovely. You can see why it's got its name. There's a lot going on in there. And also because the moon does come past it quite often, which is always yeah. a great photo opportunity when it does. Yeah. If anybody does capture any photos of the moon when it's going past this time, accompanied by Mars, please do send yeah. them in to we contact like to us see. at skynightmagazine.com because we always love to see them. Yeah. It's going to be a lovely sight to see, I think. So 21st, I will try and have a look. Well, early hours of the morning. <laughs> we do talk about late night, early morning, don't we? It can be quite difficult sometimes. So Yeah, it's the hazard of being an astronomer. Well, that, is yeah. Fortunately, I've always been a bit of a night owl. I think astronomy does tend to attract people who are night owls. Yeah. And I think these days, really, you don't really have a choice because you just have to make the best of the weather. So, yeah. you know, if it's cloudy... Well, if it's clear at any time of the night or the morning, you just have to kind of get up and make the most of it, don't you? Because mm. it's just cloud all the time here now. So, <laughs> yes, get out there and seize the chance. So Mars, the Moon and the Beehive Cluster, they're all going to be visible together, moving to the southwest right through until the sun washes them away. Now, M44 is a naked eye target with a magnitude of plus three. But, you know, I'm thinking with the moon so close by, you will want to use a pair of small binoculars to have a good view. So this is my description of trying to find M44, and I hope it makes sense to people. So to locate the Beehive Cluster, if you can imagine an upside-down triangle with Mars and the Moon forming the two points of the base of the triangle, and the Beehive Cluster below forming the point, hopefully that is how you will get to see the beehive cluster or point you in the direction of it at least. But yeah, I mean, disclaimer, use a star chart or an app to help you (laughs) if my description wasn't good enough. It's one of the benefits of having the moon or Mars or something be close to one of these sort of more deep sky objects is that if you're learning your way around the night sky, it's a great way to point you there. That's right. Quite literally in this case, if it's forming a triangle, it's it's the triangle and it'll be right at the point. (laughs) Because I think star hopping can be quite difficult if you're a beginner, can't it? Yeah. Especially depending on your eyesight, how dark the sky is. As I mentioned last week, my spatial awareness is not the best. <laughs> yeah. And so when people say it's like, oh, it's the same distance again away, or it's like five times this, I'm like, I have no idea what that is. I can't, yeah. I can't picture that in my brain. It can be tricky. But it's like I had to learn how to get to the Polaris from the plough. Okay. Uh, by just looking at star charts and sort of getting into my brain how far that, far away that was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, like, the myth is as well, isn't it? People think the North Star is just super bright. And they it's just not. Think, well, yes, it is. It's it not, be quite it's not a dim star, but no. it's, uh, I think it's something like it's somewhere in the 20s. If you, like, list the stars in the Northern Hemisphere by brightness, it's a fair way down. Yeah. People sometimes point to the sky and they're like, oh, that's the that's the North Star. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's like completely opposite direction. But... Well, there's often like people point, it's like, oh, there's a really bright star there. And it's not a star, it's a planet. It's a planet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you see a really, really bright star in the sky, it's not a star, it's a planet. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, it's, it's quite hard as well trying to tell people these things as well without sounding like a know-it-all, I find. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, you're just wrong. You're just totally wrong. So... <laughs> Yeah, so like I said, hopefully my description gently will... Gently correct people. Gently, yes, gently correct, yes. It's a good Did idea. you know? Well, why, don't we, yeah, why don't we get a star app or a, a sky guide to have a look at? Yeah, so hopefully, you know, we'll get to see that lovely trio of, of Mars, the Moon and the Beehive Cluster. So I mentioned last week, from the night of the 17th into the 18th, there's the Leonid meteor shower. Well, obviously, it's the peak is 
in the early hours of the 18th. So just to recap from last week, but as we mentioned, you know, the moon's going to be 98% illuminated, but, you know, we're only going to expect to see around 10 per hour and they do leave persistent trains. So it probably is worthwhile going out Mm -hmm. to have a look. And by persistent trains, what we mean is that it will stay in the sky for a bit longer. Yes. Because there are some which are more shooting stars, you know, meteors and shooting stars, they're the same thing, but there are definitely some which they're a sort of bright streak of light and then they're gone. I love it when you see the trails that they leave behind sometimes as well, meteors, I love that. Yeah, and there's some which they sort of just stay in the night sky there for a little bit longer. Yeah. There's also occasionally you get some which seem to move really slowly. And we do occasionally get people writing in to say, I saw this, was it a satellite? Something like that, because it didn't move like a plane, but I don't really know what it was. Yeah, it wasn't flashing. It's a slow moving meteor. That brings me actually, it just makes me think of, you know, the Winchcombe meteorite when the yes. fireball. Did you see that? I didn't see the fireball, no. I know I missed it, but some people where I live in South Wales, they saw it that night. And I was so annoyed that, because I think I had been out observing and I must have come back into the house. And then it wasn't, you know, a bit later on, people were like, oh, did anyone see that bright fireball in the sky? And then, yeah, because oh, mm. <laughs> if you see a fireball moving across the night sky, it will draw your attention. Yeah. Like I have seen one and it's not that one. <laughs> it's a different one. And they will make you turn your head and look at them. Oh, yeah. Just amazing, aren't they? I believe it's classed as a fireball if it's brighter than the planet Venus. And they're not uncommon. There's one, I think, every couple of weeks, and there's the UK Fireball Alliance. Yes. UK Fall, who, if you do see a fireball, let them know because they keep track of them. And they're one of the people in the UK who help to find things like the Winchcombe meteorite because they see these fireballs and there's people with cameras all over the country who are tracking them. And they follow the path of these because... Most meteors, if they are big enough to have some debris that's going to land on the ground, they land in the 70% of the world that is sea and ocean. But occasionally they do land on Earth and then they dispatch teams of people to go and try and find them like they did in Winchcombe. It was amazing, wasn't it? I just loved that when I was following it on the news and things and then just seeing the charts of how they actually managed to pinpoint you know, where it was, but obviously someone found it on their driveway, which I suppose was a big help. Yeah, um, yeah this, is, this is one of the big problems with, even if it does come down in an area where you're able to recover it, how do you tell a meteorite apart from a pebble? Or well, that's it, yeah. They do look different, but you need to be a really good expert to try and differentiate yeah. them. So it's either it comes down somewhere like a desert or a snow plain where oh, it's a rock in the middle of somewhere where there yeah. aren't any rocks. It must have come from the sky. Or you get very lucky and it comes down on someone's driveway. <laughs> and I was like, what were the chances of that happening? But yeah, yeah. hopefully we'll all see a fireball soon. That'd yeah, I have really like, enjoyed reading up about in the years following that. Oh, uh, yeah. 2021, I think it was, it was recovered. And they're now learning all sorts of things about it. And it's always fascinating when those sort of crop up. And we have some stories about that over on our website, skyatnightmagazine.com. I'll put some links in the show notes as well if people would like to read up about that. Excellent. We love a meteorite, don't we? We've spoken about (laughs) this before. And uh, yeah, you promised you were going to come on the camera and share some of your meteors. I do. I need to remember to bring it in one day. (laughs) (laughs) We'll do a special occasion. Well, thank you very much for taking us through everything to see in the night sky this week, Katrin. If you want to keep up to date with even more stargazing highlights, please subscribe to the podcast and we'll be back next week with even more. But to summarise this week again, the moon is going to be waning all week. On the 18th, the moon, Mars, Jupiter and Uranus are stretching from the east to the south. Moon, Mars and Jupiter are all going to be naked eye objects, but you will need a telescope or binoculars to see Uranus. On the early morning in the 18th, we'll also see the peak of the Leonids meteor shower, so keep an eye out for that. On the 20th, Titan's shadow crosses the planet Saturn, and there'll be good viewing from the UK, provided, as always, it isn't cloudy. On the 21st, it's the very early hours of the morning. Look to the east after midnight to see Mars, a 70% waning moon, and the M4 beehive cluster, which will all be grouped together in the constellation of Cancer. 
Venus is spotted low to the southwest horizon all week, visible in the evening twilight and setting around 6.45 by the week's end. And finally, Comet A3 Susanshan Atlas will be visible throughout the week. You will need binoculars to see it, as it will be starting the week at around magnitude 8.2 and ending at around 8.8. So still around, but beginning to fade away. That's all from us this week. We hope to see you all back again next week. Goodbye. If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered, with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Thank you.